For those needing CME, is eruption. Whoever picks these words out is creative. Uh, also, I'm always intrigued how late in the day they come. I got my uh, email at 8:45 last night. We we're having this session, so uh, Kimberly works different hours than Joan used to. Very different. Anyway, uh, just one other announcement. I think Matt wants to practice a presentation that he needs to give at a national meeting and use us as a practice audience for criticism. So as many people who can stay at 8 to roughly 8.30, please do so. Uh, Nick Compton has been very kind and for, I don't know, is this the third year, fourth this year? Is this, this is this your second? Yeah, this is the second time, yeah. Okay, this good. Um, see, I'm just getting old, seem long in that. Um, <laughs> is going to give us a presentation on uh, uh, dermatology for the allergist, I think uh, highlighting a lot of things that mimic his hives. Thanks very much.
Okay. So uh, what I wanted to do today was to talk uh, a little bit about um, I, have four, I have four cases, and they would be uh, referrals that 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 would be sent uh, maybe from a primary care doctor or from a dermatologist, hopefully not a dermatologist, um, for a referral for hives. And I don't know, maybe you guys would have better um, filters uh, so these patients uh, wouldn't necessarily get to you. Uh, but these are some conditions that, that may be considered their, their eruption uh, may be considered by, uh, by non-specialists as, as highs. And I wanted to kind of uh, just give you guys a few tools, if you don't have them already, uh, to be able to distinguish these from highs. Certainly there'll, there'll be some historical data, um, some physical exam findings that'll probably be, that, that, may, that may be new. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about how you might evaluate some of these things. So I, I have no relevant conflicts of, of interest, and, and that's probably why the email went out so late is because it took me until last night to get my disclosures, and I don't have any. But So that's probably why the email was late. Um, so here's our objectives today. So by the end of, of today, I hope uh, you'll be able to identify some historical details. These are patient historical details to know when to suspect a mimicker of urticaria. And I suspect you guys have know this already. Uh, identify specific physical exam findings of some of these mimickers, and then to develop, finally, uh, an evaluation strategy for suspected mimickers. I'm not going to talk about, about therapy at all. So this is, these are the four cases, and, um, and I really want, I want you guys to, to, lead, to lead this. Um, uh, I'll be up front, but I want you guys to lead this. I've got a bunch of links throughout the, the talk. Um, and so you guys can choose which case we go to. Uh, if we get through one case only, that's okay. If we get through all cases, that's fine too. Um, so here's the, here's the four cases that I've, that I've come up with. Uh, so uh, up here in the upper left-hand corner, uh, allergic to condoms. Uh, to the right of that, uh, severely itchy old man. I apologize uh, for anybody who's older than 79, the patient is 79, maybe I should have taken old out. Um, painful hives down the lower left, and then incredibly, incredible growing hives. So these are the chief complaints of the these patients? Are, these, are, these are descriptors. These are descriptors. Where would you like to start? Painful, <coughs> painful hives. All right. Painful hives. Okay. Oh, oh, no. Not. Oh no, no. Well, it means my links may not be working. That's, that's maybe the problem. Let's see. Yeah. Well, we'll start, I guess we'll, we're, we may be all be coming back to allergic to condoms for all. We may be doing this, we may be doing this four times. Um, okay, well, here's, here's, uh, let me, let me just, I'll just. It's all the same thing. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Well, we'll see. This this is no, this is the uh, Mac to to PC problems here, I think. Anyway, so here's painful hives. So here's a forty five year old woman with a four month history of uh, painful hives and some mild joint. So this is the referral that, that comes in. Like I said, you guys may have better filters. Um, uh, and so this patient may not get to your clinic because of the, the painful part of things or uh, whatever, but for whatever reason, this patient is now in your office. And these are the, these are the, this is the information that I've got available. Um, and you can, you can drive this. I will say though, uh, let's wait to get to the physical exam maybe until a little bit later until we get a little bit more, a little bit more history. Hopefully, these links will work. <laughs> I'm not. I'm we always not, start, at, start the beginning. We always start at an exam with history. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. So, what would you like to know about? Okay. Cross your fingers, everyone. Oh, hey, all right, it worked. Okay. So, uh, the whole thing started about four months ago, and they seem to sort of come up in, in crops. They're sort of, sort of all of a sudden. So, here's a there's a crop here. And then sometime later, I'll get another crop of these painful, painful, what she's calling hives. Okay, onset. Lesion duration. Lesion duration. 
Exactly. So you guys are keying into the, I mean, so this is the historic, of all of these, right, this is the, the main historical data that's going to tell you that this is not, these are not hives, right? So the lesions seem to come up in crops at various times, and they seem to last several days to weeks. That information right there tells you, hey, wait a minute, these aren't hives. When they do go away, they seem to leave a little bit of a bruise. Diagnosis back there. Any other any associated other, uh, symptoms? Okay. Let's see symptoms. So the skin lesions are painful and they burn a little bit. She also says uh, her hands, ankles, and feet are a little bit sore as well. We don't have to go through all of these either. Medication. Okay. So she takes milk thistle and uh, and a multivitamin. No medication. Milk thistle is a what, what is what is milk thistle? Milk thistle is a, um, a supplement that some people will use because they believe that it removes toxins out of their liver. So it's sort of a liver a liver cleansing uh, supplement. Probably look at the lesions. You want to look at the lesions? Okay, so we're moving right we're moving right on. All right. Oh no. So sorry, this went to the wrong went to the wrong physical exam. Sorry guys. Oh we have a picture on paper here too. Oh you do. Yeah, you're right. And I made it in color. Cost our office a lot of money. <laughs> so here's the uh, here's the here's an image of, of her physical exam. So we have these these uh predicarial Papules and plaques. Papules we we describe as a bump that's less than a, a centimeter, but um, you know, that's not that important. Uh, uh, papules and plaques that are that are urticarial, so they look they look edematous. They look um, like they're they're full of something. Um, on her on her foot here, there's a close-up view. It even actually has some some surrounding. Uh, pallor to it. And then I want you to uh, take a look at this larger plaque on her thigh here. We have this sort of uh, inflammatory border that's indurated and thick. You don't see much scale here, so that tells you we're dealing with a, a dermal problem. We don't have a, an epidermal process going on. And then centrally, there's this hyperpigmentation or, or bruise. And that story of uh, <clears throat> Painful urticaria that resolve with either bruise or hyperpigmentation should lead you to sort of to this idea of uh, what this gentleman talked about a few slides ago of urticarial vasculitis. Um, another physical exam finding that, that can be helpful um, is to see uh, small petechiae within the, uh, the plaques. So for about eight to ten dollars, you can get a small pocket magnifying glass. And I find those really, really helpful to be able to, to see subtle, subtle findings on, on, on physical exam, whether I find a little bit of scale or something like a small little bit of petechiae. Another thing that can be helpful in that is to take a, a glass slide and you know, uh, apply pressure for diascopy, and that'll help bring out some of that, that petechiae, petechiae as well. So this is urticarial vasculitis. The peak incidence is in, a, is in the 40s, uh, is in the fifth, fifth decade, and there's a strong female, female predominance. Um, when we think about urticarial vasculitis, the, things that, the main thing that we want to make sure is that this patient it doesn't have hypocomplementemic uh, vasculitis. And thankfully, most patients don't. Most patients have normal complementemic uh, vasculitis. And it really kind of is, is, thought to, is, is, a, react, is a reactive process. Often, too, uh, medications can be seen by, <clears throat> from uh, NSAIDs, um, uh, from uh, etanerceptin and fleximab, uh, actually. Uh, methotrexate has been, has been uh, uh, described to, to be a, a, a instigator of urticarial vasculitis. Um, infectious processes like uh, the viral uh, hepatitis uh, B and hepatitis C virus. And hepatitis C virus, uh, you can get normal complementemic uh, urticarial vasculitis with or without cryos. Uh, so it's a, one thing to think about. And this, and this patient, had we gotten to her, her past medical history, she's got a history of IV, IV drug use and is, and is hepatitis C positive, and it's probably the driver of this in, in, in her. But when you see these patients with, with um, 
uh, urticarial vasculitis, uh, one thing you want to think about is do they, are they normal complementemic or are they hypocomplementemic? The hypocomplementemic uh, uh, urticarial vasculitis syndrome um, is, has a lot of overlap with, with lupus. Uh, about 50% of patients will end up uh, meeting the research criteria for, for lupus over time. Um, but not, but not all of them. Some people sort of feel like it's a, it's an equivalent to, to lupus female predominance. Uh, the numerous number that develop all the criteria, or at least meet criteria for, for lupus over time. Uh, many of them will have a positive ANA. There's a smaller percentage of them that have a, a positive double-stranded uh, DNA and the hypocomplementemic urticarial vasculitis. I've only seen, I've seen one patient with that, and that was before I was uh, uh, a dermatologist. It was when I was a medicine resident. And, and uh, she had a profound disease and ended up dying of a, of a perforated colon uh, related to her, her, her underlying systemic disease. How do you test for that? Do you do yeah. Or... Yeah, so um, uh, clinically, uh, we'll talk a little bit about what, what you're going to see. The cl classic is, is that you're going to have um, these sort of eruptive uh, crops of urticarial papules and plaques that that lasts longer than 36 hours of regular urticaria, which is going to be a historical <laughs> clue. And then uh, uh, clinically, they're, they're going to resolve with either hyperpigmentation and or, or bruising. Um, let's see. So the evaluation, so investigate for systemic disease. So we're going to, you know, when you see these patients, you want to look for under, potential underlying causes, SRD, <coughs> hepatitis B, hepatitis C, ask about a, a get a good medication history. Um, and some medications have been associated with uh, with that. Um, talk about infections, especially hepatitis C. And then complements. You want to get a CH50, C3, C4. And then um, most of them will also have this anti-C1Q antibody or anti-C1 precipitant. Um, most of them have that as a, a, a positive antibody. A lot of patients, or some patients with lupus will also have that even without urticarial vasculitis. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of overlap. Um, you see, if you see low complements, anti-C1Q antibody, and a low C1Q level, you should, in a patient with urticaria vasculitis on, based on biopsy, um, you should be certainly thinking about hypercomplementemic urticaria vasculitis. Yes? You use the word plaque to describe this, and that's not something we usually use to describe urticaria, so, it's, so I thought that was more psoriatic. Well, a plaque, a plaque <coughs> you can, in general terms, you can think of a plaque as anything greater than a centimeter, that you can feel if you put your hand over, if you rub your finger over. So a raised, greater than a centimeter thing, you could call it, you could call it plaque. Yeah, okay. typically when we think of plaque, most of the time when we're, when we're talking about the terminology of dermatology and we show pictures and we're talking about a plaque, we show psoriasis because they're such beautiful, well-demarcated plaques. Um, an urtic, a, a wheel, high urticaria, um, we sort of think of as uh, as a primary lesion in, in dermatology, um, but in a general sense, they're they're raised, um, often greater than a centimeter lesions, and so I think you could you, you, you could call them a, you could call them a plaque. Um, and it, 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 in uh, this with with mimickers, um, you we would we would um, add the adjective uh, verticarial plaque to describe sort of it looks like a hive. Um, and then uh, uh, ANA, sort of looking for uh, underlying maybe SLE. Cryos in the right in the right setting if they're hepatitis C positive. And then there has been some association with IgM and IgG monoclonal antibodies with urticarial vasculitis as well. So I think an SPEP would be something reasonable to do. Um, and then skin biopsy, I think can be um, really helpful. So. If you have somebody with you suspect urticarial vasculitis and you uh, need a skin biopsy, they're fairly easy to do, and I'd be happy to teach anybody how to how to do them. But we're also happy to see these patients and and give you a hand on on uh, on diagnosis. And what do you expect to see in the biopsy? Yeah, so you, you expect to see um, uh, a lots of dermal edema, which uh, that's what helps give that that sort of urticarial appearance of, uh, clinically. And then you see vasculitis. So you see the uh, four things of vasculitis are red blood cell extravasation, so red blood cells out in the dermis. You see um, neutrophil uh, cariorexis, so the neutrophils have kind of been, been chewed up, so you see neutrophilic debris. 
you see uh, fibrinoid necrosis of the, of the um, uh, blood vessels and, um, uh, uh, and, and the vasculitis sort of clotting of the, of the blood vessels. Yeah. Okay. Given that, why doesn't it look purpuric like other vasculitis? So that's, so that's the, um, if you do some diastasis, uh, you'll see some petechiae in there. And then that, that, that resolving, with, when, the, when the raised area resolves and it leaves that bruise or hyperpigmentation, that's what you're seeing. You're seeing that, that red blood cell extrapolation into the, into the terms. Just so the biopsy diagnostic, I'm sorry. No, that's fine. Is the biopsy diagnostic, like if you get it, you'll, they'll say, oh, that's a of vasculitis, or is it nonspecific, like most of the biopsies you get back in terms of <laughs> Um, yeah, so that's what keeps us in business, right, is the non specific uh, So um, they're, they're, rel they're, relatively, they're relatively specific. So um, it's really LCD kind of on a, on a, uh, a high-looking background. You often have a lot of eosinophils in there as well, especially if it's related to, related to drugs. So, so it's, it's relatively specific, yeah. I mean, I think uh, a lot of dermatology is, is uh, trying to meld that that clinical path correlation. And so if you had, you could have a very, it, it'll look a lot like just regular LCD, but you look at the patient and say, gosh, that's not, that's not very typical leukocytoclastic vasculitis, right? That's on the legs, usually in the palpable purpose, as you, as you were alluding to. So um, sometimes, yeah, you do have to, to kind of make that, make that connection. So uh, uh, differences between urticaria and urticaria vasculitis, of course, urticaria, you guys all know, resolve uh, without any evidence. They're transient, uh, usually less than a day or a day and a half. Uh, new lesions are often uh, form daily. Very, very itchy. Urticarial vasculitis, on the other hand, uh, will leave some footprint that it was there before, this, this footprint of the inflammation that was there. Uh, they're fixed, and they usually last days to weeks, <clears throat> tend to develop in uh, eruptive crops, and then uh, sort of painful and, painful and burning. So in our, in our uh, referral, the urticarial features that, urticarial vasculitis features that we saw by history were uh, to describe painful urticaria, lesions that were fixed for more than 36 hours, and then this, this resolution with, with bruising. Uh, in our, phys our physical exam, we saw the urticarial pa papillosome plaques with, with uh, a petechia and diascopy, and then uh, uh, the footprint of areas that had been involved uh, in the past. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, that word diascopy, I don't think we had it when I went to medical school. Is it new? Did you just... No, 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 it's actually old. It's, uh, it, it, it was... Um, uh, I think I think when glass slides were invented, they they figured out the term uh, diascopy. Yeah. So what does it mean? So it's where you it's just where you um, you apply pressure with a with a glass slide or a, you could any sort of any sort of glass something glass slide is what we normally have. You just apply pressure to a lesion, blanch it, and sort of see if there's uh, other colors. Specific mo most of the time we're looking sort of for uh, uh, petechiae. Sometimes you use that for patients that have hepatitis C or they've got liver disease, cirrhosis, and they've got the spider angioma diascopy is a fun thing to kind of show students. You, know, you push in there, you can see that one sort of pulsating arterial uh, with a spider angioma, which is kind of, kind of fun. And sometimes, you know, because some, sometimes uh, there's a, a condition here, the incredible growing hives, that you can have some erythema to the lesions, but if you if you get that erythema out of there, you'll end up seeing more of a, a tan red brown color, which can be helpful in your in your if you're considering the diagnosis. Uh, so we're doing that sort of stuff a lot. Kind of Are there any new approaches to treatment for it? Or? Urticarial vasculitis. Uh, not not I mean not not that I'm not that I'm a It's uh, related to medicines. Try to uh, uh, um, stop the medicines if you can. Uh, if they have, uh, you know, underlying lupus, want to treat their sort of underlying lupus. If they have underlying gamma, sort of underlying gamma, try to treat that. Sort of things that you could try, sort of early on. You no, know, I just swear Gilliland when he gave his talk said they respond to antihistamines usually. It's a good question. I don't, it's, it's not, not a jump to the other thing. It's not a histamine driven process. I know, but I swear Gillen would say that most of the time they don't respond to antihistamines anyway. <laughs> Maybe that would be. Uh, 
think you made it. I made it up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that we're trying to spread this up, right? So, <laughs> but culture scene, you said? Yeah, culture scene, DAP zone, um, uh, indomethacin would be things that make me think of sort of early, early on. But. Steroids? Steroids, yeah, I mean, steroids help just by hastening your germ. So, uh, I mean, unless they're atypical mycobacterial infection. <laughs> and then it just make it, it may make that more prominent or easy to diagnose. Um, all right. How does that medicine work? That sounds counterintuitive. It's, a, it's a, an excellent question. I mean, sometimes we use it for um, the, the discomfort in, in sort of in skin only leukocytoplastic vasculitis as well. Just to still use them as to sort of help. Uh, just, 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 they get some mild uh, ankle swelling, arthralgia. Uh, so, I mean, I, that would be, you know, just for kind of for skin only. If somebody's got for leukocytic classic vasculitis, they have kidney disease or severe disease, you're going to use some different so. All right, that was painful hives. Painful that's uh, things that. Allergic to condoms, severely itchy, moderately old man. Old man. Old man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's see. So this will, this will, let's see. He has a, 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 Maybe 90 year old, maybe it's better. better. 90 year old man with uh, three month history of generalized highs. Uh, no new medications, and he has an elevated eosinophil count of about uh, 800. So that's our that's our referral, and and he's uh, now and he's now in your office. Obviously, you want to know onset. Onset. Okay, start there. So, so he says, I started to get itchy lesions about three months ago. Some have gone away, but new ones have, new, new ones have sort of shown up over that, over that time. <laughs> most, most have come and gone, uh, but they last several weeks when they're there. Uh, some of the spots are, are newer, he says, that he's got today. In the past couple of weeks, uh, he says, some of them have maybe even turned into blisters. Oh. Oh. Associated symptoms. Okay. Very, very itchy. Medications. Meds, excellent. So he's on amlodipine, um, which I don't know if you guys are seeing. Uh, we see, we've been seeing a lot of, of uh, older folks with, uh, uh, who've been on amlodipine for quite a long time and they're getting this sort of nondescript uh, itchy red bumps. I don't know if you guys are if you guys are getting those patients and stop the motopine and they and they get better. It may take a few months, but it's been a, uh, certainly seen a lot of that. Uh, aspirin, uh, teresin, <clears throat> levothyroxine, and then uh, ibuprofen uh, on as needed basis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So uh, he thinks that maybe he's got bed bugs, but nobody else in the house is really itchy. Uh, none. He's tried oral uh, diphenhydramine, calamine lotion, and steroid creams, but nothing really seems to, to uh, have a lasting effect. You have to look at them. Everything look at them. Is looking at. Got to look at them. All right. This is what he looks like. Um, uh, he's got these uh, erythematous papules and, and a, 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 up here on his upper upper back, sort of coalescing into a, a larger plaque. We've got this huge plaque down here on his lower back. You can see the backs of his arms are, in, are involved. And in fact, he's got some, some swelling in the areas as well. Um, here's his, his arm. You see, we're seeing some denuded skin here, so he's got a little erosion on the inner proximal forearm. And then on his chest here, the midline is spared, which is curious, but you see this uh, large erythematous uh, patch with uh, tense bullae uh, on, the, on the chest. This, this guy waited three months to come and see you. It happens. It happens. <laughs> yeah. Um, Patients wait three hours. 
So uh, this is both pencil void, and we talked we talked a little bit about this uh, last time I was here. We talked about autoimmune bolus conditions. So both pencil void is something that we see is a very very itchy condition. So I think of when somebody comes into the in the clinic and they're and they're really really itchy. I think of both pencil void, dermatitis herpetiformis, uh, which we talked about last time as well. Scabies. Think about scabies, urticaria pigmentosa or mastocytosis uh, would be things that I would sort of be asking and sort of thinking about and clinically looking for. So it usually happens in, um, in uh, patients of retirement age, uh, so in the sort of 65 to 70. Your risk of uh, both pemphigoid at 90 is significantly higher than it is at 60. So uh, after 60, your, your risk goes up almost exponentially. Very, very, very itchy. Um, why is that? Why is age a factor? Does your skin just fail? Or what? That's a good, so really, it's an excellent question. I um, uh, don't really know. I mean, there are, I think, I think, I think that's, that's probably, probably true. Um, it may be that there, there's an accumulation of um, exposure to the bullet liquid antigens uh, over your lifetime. Uh, that at some at some point you end up developing uh, enough antibody and antibody response uh, to it. Um, I mean, we see in some other conditions. Um, I'm thinking about um, there's a there's a condition in HIV called pruritic papular eruption of HIV. It's seen in, in very low CD4 counts. And um, in some of those, those patients, they have seen uh, circulating post pemphigoid antigen antibodies. Um, you know, so why, you know why, is, why, is that, why is that happening? There's a lot of immune dysregulation in HIV, but maybe it's just that there's this exposure. And so maybe if you have a fairly normal immune system over time, and, uh, you're, but you're in frequently, intermittently getting exposed to your, or this, these uh, proteins are being exposed, maybe develop antibodies over time? It's an, excellent, it's an excellent question, and I'm not sure that there's, I don't have an answer. Um, usually you'll see these urticarial plaques kind of on the flexural surfaces, and then on the trunk would be the sort of more common, more common places to see them. And then large, very large and, and tense bullae, as opposed to pemphigus, which oftentimes you don't see the, the vesicles at all. Uh, the reason you see the vesicles in here is because the split is deeper down in the skin, so you have all of that epidermis over the top of it to, uh, to keep that, that, blister, that blister intact. Clinically, you can have an urticarial phase of BP. You can have an urticarial phase of BP the entire duration of the disease, which is uncommon. Uh, but it's fairly common to have urticarial phase, both pemphigoid, for weeks or even months before you see your first blister. So that may be maybe why they're not or they're not presenting to, to uh, dermatology or to, to you guys for hives is uh, their primary care doctor's trying to sort of trying to take care of. Um, so uh, without, without uh, uh, blister formation, you have to have kind of a high index of suspicion to be thinking about both pemphigoid and to be able to do the sort of right tests for, to, to diagnose both pemphigoid. Um, but, uh, as opposed to, to uh, urticaria, of course, the lesions in bolus pemphigoid are going to last several weeks, so they're, they're not going to be transient like you have in, in um, urticaria. In, uh, uh, the difference is sort of here, uh, urticaria, uh, you know, often have that central zone, well, they have, they have a central zone of normal skin. It doesn't mean it's normal looking, because oftentimes you have that, that pallor over the top of a hive, right, because the significant edema. Um, but the, the epidermis is intact, and you don't have scale, you don't have necrosis of the, of the central area, which we'll talk about in another presentation. Urticaria transient, new lesions every day, no erosions or ulcerations. So in both pemphigoid, you have these urticarial plaques, which, which may look exactly like urticaria, but they may also have this bullet, which is gonna be your, your clinical, or your physical, physical exam fluid. Fixed, they last for several weeks. Uh, new lesions may, may appear daily, uh, but they're going to last longer. And then uh, ulcers in both pemphigoid as opposed to pemphigus have a tendency to heal on their own. So you get urticarial plaques, very, very itchy, you get a blister, that erodes, and then over weeks, that, that erosion, that superficial ulceration, uh, will heal on its own, as opposed to pemphigus where the ulcers just get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So evaluation of a patient with uh, both pemphigoid, you want to uh, perform a mucosal exam. So there, is, there, is, uh, there are some patients that have um, 
cutaneous disease, but then also a cicatricial uh, benign mucous membrane pemphigoid. So look at their mouths, look in their eyes. Also help if there's eucosal involvement that raises the possibility more of a pemphigus rather than pemphigoid. Medication history, so there are some meds that are more associated with causing um, uh, both pemphigoid gold, for instance, uh, penicillamine, penicillin, and captopril are the ones that we sort of, we try to remember for our derm boards. Uh, in, in doing a lab evaluation, I would consider doing a CBC with diff looking for eosinophilia. Um, anti, uh, both pemphigoid antigens <coughs> one and two, you can do ELISA for them. And this is probably better than doing indirect immune fluorescence. Um, in terms of its sensitivity and specificity. If you, have a if you get a negative bullous pemphigoid antigen one and two, both of those are negative, it's very, very, very unlikely to patient with bullous pemphigoid. Very unlikely. <clears throat> and then for, for bullous pemphigoid, I mean, I think uh, a key to the diagnosis is, is getting a skin biopsy. And we, we would biopsy a lesion, and then we would also biopsy adjacent normal skin for direct immune fluorescent looking for the uh, antibodies in the uh, along the basement membrane zone. Can Stephen's Johnson look just like this? Um, uh, no. You, you know, just tell me the difference. Just so. Yeah, Stephen's Johnson is going to be uh, a little bit more acute onset, painful skin rather than itchy skin. So when when a when when a patient is saying I have itchy skin, I, I usually relax. Um, uh, if, I, if we're thinking about uh, Stevens Johnson or TEN, um, usually, uh, well, for um, definition of SJS is to have two mucous membranes involved. Both well, pemphigoid, it's uncommon to have mucous membrane involvement, but it would, but it would look. In Stevens Johnson, they almost, they almost always have, they always have uh, a mucous membrane involvement, <laughs> and it's uh, usually uh, kind of hemorrhagic. You know, think of that, that those hemorrhagic crusts on the lips. Um, in, in Stevens Johnson syndrome, but I would say a real key, a key historical uh, difference or, or patient history difference would be painful skin versus itchy skin. Can you get the anti BP antigen commercially? Yep. Yeah. This yeah, they have it. They have it at the UW. Yeah. Yeah. So what is the protein that's the antigen? So the antigen, there are two antigens. So BP antigen uh, one and BP antigen two. BP antigen one is a transmembrane. Uh, transmembrane uh, protein in the hemidesmosome, um, so it crosses the, the keratinocyte basement, uh, inferior aspect of the basement membrane, uh, or the uh, cell membrane, um, and uh, BPN, it, it's a 180 kilodalton uh, uh, protein, so it's also called BP180, um, and there's BP230, uh, which is BP antigen 2, and that one's an intracellular um, uh, protein in the basal keratinocytes as well. Um, I can't remember the, the exact sort of family that they're in, that they're in um, whether they're, they're like plaque and, plaque and protein. Terms. And the reason it's a tense bullet, again, is I had it backwards, it's deeper, so it stays deeper. intact. Yeah, exactly, than yeah. Pemphigus. Than pemphigus. And, and uh, I'm not sure if this is helpful, but pemphigoid ends in the D, so it's deeper, pemphigus ends in the S, so it's more superficial. Yeah. How specific is the anti BP antigen one and two? I, I got I saw a patient last year and it was significantly elevated and I sent them to you guys and, you and we said, we yeah, said I'm uh, not sure, maybe. Yeah. Good question. Yeah, that's surprising that's surprising. I mean it, you know, I think um I in I, I would I, I would um if they had positive BP antigen one, um I, I would strongly <coughs> Strongly consider it it, it, uh, um, it accurate. Having said that, as I talked about with that predict papular eruption of HIV, um, sometimes we see positive BP antigen in that too, and and so it's not 100% specific, but it, it's it certainly on the, in the high nines. I don't know the exact I don't know the exact number. How does, how does the um, antibody work with pathophysiology? <laughs> that allows the cells to separate or something? It's an excellent, it's an excellent question. So most, um, most of the patients with BP, the, um, it's, it's I, IG, IgG1, um, I believe IgG1, it's complement fixing IgG anyway. And so it binds to the proteins, brings complement, and the complement then breaks down the, the uh, basement membrane zone and causes your split. Um, there is a subset, uh, though, of both pemphigoid that is IgG4 predominant. My 
understanding is IgG4 does not fix complement. Um, and <clears throat> and the, some, the most labs don't, won't, pick, won't pick it up. So if you have somebody that you strongly believe has both pemphigoid, this may, you, this may not ever, you may not see this in your practice, but somebody who you strongly believe has both pemphigoid, if their BP antigens are negative, um, you can send uh, their serum to Utah, and they have IgG4 specific <clears throat> Uh, reagents, and, and you can pick up a subset of patients that are IgG4 predominant, both pemphigoid. And their DIF will also be negative because they don't, they, the reagents for your DIF are also looking for, not, they're not IgG4 specific, and you're not going to pick up the C3 that you can normally see on DIF because they're not complement fixing. Will the dermatopathologist do an extra test if you just don't ask for, you know, the right antibody, and then they see it and they think it's polis pemphigoid. Will they go back and do the test to prove that? Well, you have to do. So you have to do the. You can't send down fixed tissue to do DIF. So you, you have to be thinking of it in clinic to put it in the right medium or media medium, I guess. So we'll get the to report that says compatible with twelve diseases. That's right. One of them will be BP. Well, so yeah, if you just if there's just an H and E that goes down, so just a biopsy of the lesion itself. It, it can look like both pemphigoid uh, would be differential. It can look like an exuberant bug bite reaction, uh, dermal hypersensitivity reaction to a medicine. So, so that differential histologically can be relatively long. Yeah. So we, you kind of have to be thinking about it on your uh, when you're doing your H and E biopsy. But I mean, it, it happens where we're, we don't think about it either, and we get the we get the histology back and say, gosh, we better look for BP and have them back and do another biopsy. Send blood free Liza. So, in our uh, referral, the features historically that were consistent with BP very, very itchy. Um, lesions are fixed. Bolle formation, which had happened just a few weeks before I saw us. Uh, tense bolle, the physical exam, tense bolle on urticarial plaques would be consistent with BP. Uh, the expected distribution, so flexural areas and on the trunk. Uh, associated edema in the uh, affected regions see on his arms, and then the superficial ulcerations uh, leading. Uh, we have the bullet to, uh, to to guide us, but when you see ulcerations um, or erosion, you should be thinking, could this have been a blister before I'm seeing this erode? So think about blistering diseases when we see erosions. <clears throat> All right. We have time for one more. we got 15 minutes. Oh, incredible growing eyes. Incredible growing highs? Yeah. All right. I know it's not going to work. I'm going to try, I'm gonna try, to, I'm gonna try to link again, but I know it's not going to work. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, you really want to talk to us about allergy to condoms that comes out every time. I know, I know. I really wanted to talk about it. I know. It just happened to be the first. happened to be the first. Uh, Let's see. All right. All right, so 78-year-old man with very itchy hives on his trunk. This is a patient I saw at the VA on his trunk, arms, and thighs, and they seem to get bigger when he scratches them. Was that, that was probably too much of a clue. So here he is, he's in your office again, and we've got a few, do I want to start at onset? You guys are liking, liking that one? Okay. So started three years ago after starting prednisone for polymyalgia rheumatica, sort of. After start, yeah, he sort of associates it with starting prednisone. Whether that's actually the case or not, I mean, lesion duration. Lesion duration. So uh, he says, I'm not really sure, but I think they stay for longer than a day. That was a question that we asked him. And he says, I think I'm getting sort of more just as time goes on. Just I think I'm getting a strong, a higher burden of these these lesions. But it's hard to tell whether um, the ones I have now or ones I started three months ago. Provoking or leaving. So I think they're worse when when I exercise, when it's hot out, and certainly when I scratch. And then I really love scotch, and, and my itching is worse in the evening. I have scotch in the evening, so maybe it's related to the scotch. I'm not sure. And then I've tried Tramsinolone, and that helps a little bit. Um, but when I wake up in the middle of the night, really, really itchy, a cold bath or shower is what really helps. Uh, review of systems. Review of systems. So I deny, I have no diarrhea, no dyspnea, abdominal pain. 
uh, no weight loss, uh, palpitation, syncope, no fevers, chills, uh, and, I, and I don't have bone pain. Does it itch before it hives? That's right. What's that? Does it, does, it, does it itch before he sees the hive or just after he rubs his skin? Well, no, uh, no it, it's... it's um, it's itchy. I have these. I have these spots. I have these. I have these spots, and they're itching. When I itch them, they seem to sort of get, sort of get bigger. What's your trip, what's your trip taste like, Mister? Oh, you guys are. <laughs> this is so. I'm just. I'm sorry. This is so elementary. No. What was? Sorry. What was the? We already look at them. Yeah. You want to look at them? Ah, sure. So this is uh, this is actually his chest um, from when he was first seen. He was first seen as a teledermatology consult, um, but this is this is his kind of lateral chest, and he's got he's got these similar papules over the top of his entire chest, um, a little bit on his upper back, but mostly on his lower back, and then kind of on the upper uh, arms, uh, and then on the, the thighs. Or uh, where these are, where these are, are located. And you scratch them, and they irritate, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Let's see. I got a. I, I thought I had a picture there, but here. So Derrier sign, right? Somebody was. Somebody already talked about Derrier sign. And Derrier sign, you can see more commonly in kids than you see in adults with with, with cutaneous mast cell cytosis. Probably because the the mast cells, the the increase in mast cells is much higher in kids than. It's only about eightfold in adults, where it's going to be fifty or hundredfold in <clears throat> in in kids. So this is this Derrier sign where you scratch it or manipulate the the, the papule and it and it urticates. You guys were all over it. Uh, so this is cutaneous mastocytosis or urticaria pigmentosa. Um, as you guys probably already know, the child, it's much more common in children. Um, probably ninety percent of the cases of urticaria pigmentosa are in children rather than in rather than in adults. When you see adults with, with cutaneous mastocytosis, you have to worry about systemic disease. And adults, so adults commonly have much, much more, much more commonly have systemic disease or systemic mastocytosis. And there are some systemic mastocytoses that don't have any skin, they don't have skin findings. Um, mast cell leukemia, mast cell sarcoma, et cetera, don't, have, don't necessarily have skin findings. They may be itchy, but they don't have skin findings. Um, uh, so somebody talked about trip, a trip taste level, right? So the for for systemic mastocytosis, the the level with which um, a positive test matters is only 20. Um, but the number of patients who have a trip taste that's 25 that have a positive bone marrow um, is low. Once you get up to 75 or 100, you're much more likely to find an abnormality in their bone marrow. So what most of the derm literature would or, uh, would suggest, if you have a tryptase level of 100 or more, to, to have that patient, consider having that patient have a bone marrow biopsy. Whereas if you're at 25, 30, and 50, not necessarily a, a, a sort of a, a, an automatic bone marrow biopsy consideration. Um, is there so, any other disease that looks like this? This that is looks like it. Um, this is the it's a really, it's a really good question. Um, uh, you know, sometimes uh, the sort of red brown kind of color that you can get. So this is a this is a kid. They tend to be sort of more tan to light brown color. In adults, they tend to have a little bit more redness or erythema to them. So in uh, this presentation, where it's kind of more, more tan, I mean, you can, you can sort of think of some of the granulomatous things. And I think you could probably think of that, that here, too, like a, a diffuse papular granuloma annulare, I think, would probably be on your differential. Um, but, usually, but GA is not as, as itchy as this. And you're certainly not going to see a, a Derrier sign. You're not going to see Derrier sign in all adults with Continuous mastocytosis, either, but if it's present, it's going to tell you a granulomatous thing. Um, uh, I suppose uh, a papular sarcoid um, could look like this, although it's not going to be as red. You're not going to have the, the red hues, uh, the erythema that, that you would have in the adult form, form of this. Um, 
So would you biopsy this if they had a tryptase of 60 and then skin pattern, you'd still do a biopsy? Probably, there? You know, probably in, yeah, we would probably, our, our um, uh, sequence of events would probably be to see the patient, biopsy them, get the pathology back that, that is suggestive of a cutaneous mastocytosis, and then, and then do the, the tryptase level. That's, that's the more likely path in our, in our clinic, where your guys' clinic may do, may do the opposite of that, where you would do a tryptase level, and, and maybe, maybe you wouldn't even think about doing a, bio, a skin biopsy. But um, uh, I suppose it's possible that somebody could have a ticks and fleas, they could have a systemic mastocytosis and then their skin rash could be something different. Um, so I suppose that's, you know, uh, one. This guy was 78 years old? 78, he's now, so, yeah. I mean, as you mentioned, is it very, is this like new disease as an older adult? Um, so it's a, it, you knew, nor, normally it's seen in, 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 young, in, young, in young kids. Um, when seen, in, when seen in adults, it's uh, more likely associated with underlying conditions. So you can see it with ongoing uh, hematologic um, conditions. So there's the systemic mastocytosis with, uh, associated with non-mast cell hematologic disease, and that's some, you know, some acro you know, right. an acronym. Um, and so in, a, in an adult, and this, this patient actually does have uh, myelodysplastic syndrome, uh, which is probably uh, related, but the myelodysplastic syndrome hasn't been sufficient enough or bad enough that the hematologists want to do much about it, so we've been trying to manage his, his itching. What's that? That was, that was, that was known in, yeah, in 2003. Um, Did he have a repeat He's had repeat bone marrow biopsy, and, and there's, there, there's a... Uh, it says there's a there is a small abnormal foam, but it's like, it's a very low of like 0.05 percent or something like that. Does he have the C kidney mutation? He doesn't, but we're um, I have him on a, on a matinib. Um, anyway, uh, he gets so drowsy uh, with it that he's cut the dose down. We thought he initially got some improvement with a matinib, but he was getting so drowsy he cut the dose down to 200, um, and his and his itch uh, seemed to be. Uh, quite bad again, so I've convinced them to go back to 400, but to try to take it at night. Um, see if that's see if that's helpful. One thing I haven't tried in him is actually is oral chromalin, um, so I think I will try try that when I see it I expect dairy or sign is sort of on a spectrum with on a continuum with dermatographism. I had a nine, yeah, seven or nine year old kid who had cutaneous mastocytosis and uh, did a bio biopsy. And, that mastocyte. The derrier sign on the lesions was pretty, you know, you rub it and you get the redness and the swelling. I said, well, what about a normal skin? You got the same redness and swelling. So, right. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I mean, I think um, when uh, I was reading about, when I was reading about this and kind of preparing this, uh, one of the uh, sources, uh, you know, one of our main uh, sort of experts in, in, in derm, um, uh, she had said that uh, you, you shouldn't be able to see necessarily the increase in mast cells in non non involved skin, non involved non involved cl you know, clinically involved involved skin. Um, uh, but that would that would certainly suggest that this patient had at least sensitive, a lot of sensitive mast cells in, yeah. in his skin yeah. um, in in apparent non involved skin. So, urticaria pigmentosa versus urticaria, again, I mean, uh, uh, you guys have know this and picked up on this in all the cases, but urticaria is transient, less than 36 hours, where in UP it's going to be more fixed. The UP tends to be slowly progressive, uh, so you're sort of developing sort of new lesions over time. The derriere sign, of course, uh, with urticaria pigmentosa, and then the clinical uh, appearance is different. Let's go back. To the picture. So the clinical different. The clinical appearance is going to be quite different, right? Um, uh, these are more of a sort of red brown, smaller papules, usually less than a centimeter. So you're not going to see sort of the big, you know, the big wheel unless you make it urticate. Um, and uh, uh, in, in children, they're going to be sort of tan to light, tan to sort of light brown. What, what's the pathology that makes these lesions just occur in the skin, sort of? Going with Chuck, why, why couldn't it be somewhere else where you couldn't see it, so that when you rub their skin, they're going to urticate there as well? 
<laughs> I mean, I think it's an excellent question. I thought you had a great answer. I mean, it's, it's, a really, it's a really good question. You know, we have our the med student course, the second year med student course. One Saturday, we we uh, we bring them to the Durham clinic and they and we go around and see a bunch of patients with with skin disease that can you know sort of illustrate some of the biology that they're learning about about skin and and and. One of the med students was, well, how come, why is it here and not here? Why, you know, I mean, these are excellent questions. I, it's a really good idea, I, good question. I don't know. I don't if know you, why, why one place and not another. If you biopsy normal skin, you find that there's absolutely no mass associated there. Not, not, uh, there's certain mast cells, but not an increased, uh, not, not an increased number of mast cells, like in the, in the lesion, in, in the lesion itself. So, I mean, it's a really good question. I don't know the answer. I mean, why does, why BP? likes the places it likes, right? You know, and, and uh, so uh, urticarial pigmentosa usually, you know, trunk proxim and proximal extremities. I mean, why not the distal extremities? I, I, I don't know, maybe, it, I don't know, maybe it has something to do with heat, I don't know. Um, so, yeah, excellent question. So evaluation of urticarial pigmentosa, so you want to investigate for systemic mass, systemic symptoms, and that was that review, of, that negative review of systems. So thinking about bone pain, uh, a lot of patients will have, have bone pain. Think about GI, um, the syncopal episodes, uh, pulmonary symptoms tend to be a little bit less of a of an issue, surprisingly, in urticaria pigmentosa. I mean, you think with this sort of mast cell, massive mast cell degranulation, you have a lot of sort of anaphylactic uh, reactions. I mean, and they can get anaphylactic reactions certainly to to uh, to bees, and the, uh, but not often as just a part of the disease itself. So wonder about do they have hematologic disease? Certainly in, in adults, you would need to need to wonder about this. Um, and so, you know, I think a CBC with diff looking at their cell line, seeing if they have any hint of a of a hematologic uh, problem, and then a serum tryptase level. Um, and again, I uh, our this patient, um, this tryptase has never actually been over over 20. It's been a little bit of it, kind of in the mid teens, but it's never been it's never been over over 20. And yet he has MPS probably probably driving probably driving all of this. So there's always exceptions. And then uh, skin biopsy is helpful certainly for 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 us. So like I said, I think in, in our clinic the flow would likely be a skin biopsy followed by the serum test in your guys' clinic and maybe maybe backwards. Did you say this patient had a negative Bone marrow, but you still put him on imatinib. Well, uh, he doesn't have this. He doesn't have. He doesn't have. The, uh, the, he doesn't have uh, actually, he doesn't have the uh, PDGF flip one uh, uh, mutation. That's that's the one that um, imatinib is supposed to be helpful for. He probably he probably does have he probably does have CKIT. That's the most common. You see that uh, mutation more in hyperacinophilic syndrome. That's right. So yeah, yeah. Do that's this right. disease. So he did. He did have well, he, more mast cells. He's got a. He's got a, a small, very small um, uh, population of abnormal mast cells, but it's very, very small. Like, like point oh five to point oh five was, was that what led you to to the imatinib, or was it just the clinical father, that, father of this? Yeah, we weren't able to really get him under control with antihistamines, and then, and, but I haven't tried oral chromo. It doesn't work very well. It doesn't work very well. For anything. <laughs> um, so last last slide, we didn't get to allergic condoms, but that's okay. Um, let's see. Let's save that for next year. So uh, as you guys know, I mean, you guys are experts in this. Historical features should raise the possibility of mimickers. So you know, I think the main one is that a lesion, and you guys dialed in on this, the lesion doesn't, you know, what's the lesion duration? And I think your exam can help differentiate mimickers uh, from urticaria and from each other. And then skin biopsies like blood tests really can provide a specific diagnosis. But I actually have a question for, for you guys. Have you guys been seeing any patients with um, this alpha-gal uh, allergy, this red meat allergy? It's only happened in the drugs here. <laughs> in where? Yeah. Well, the guy who discovered it, Tom Platzenberg, is in our yeah. field. He's a real character. And he's the one who did the leading work. Um, so it's in that region. And he's in Charlottesville at the University of Virginia. Yeah. And that's, that's, where, where, huh? that's where the ticks are. That's where the ticks are. Yeah. Yeah. We don't have the ticks. So somebody who's from that area. 
Yeah. My son has that after he got bit by a tick. So he does. He it's lives in he lives in Lynchburg, which is sixty miles from Charlottesville. Oh, okay. It, I guess how how wide so how widespread is that tick? I have a patient at the VA who um, is convinced this is what he has, and uh, he had been hunting. At, I was thinking it was more in the East Midwest East. area though, yeah. where he was hunting, was bit by a tick. Um, he's sure he is he he where he he's fairly certain he was bit by a tick. What part of the country? I think Midwest area. I don't know. Spe- I don't know specifically. It's lo- it's the Lone Star yeah. tick. Lone Star, right? right. So, um, and I think uh, the guy who discovered uh, Starry, um, uh, I think, was somewhere in Missouri. I think um, Madsen, Madsen. I think was his name. Um, but you know, I had a patient, and I ended up giving this alpha gal IgE, um, and it's it's negative. Which sort of excludes. Should I? Does that exclude, does that, is I think that so. fairly? Yeah. I think that's the definitive test. Okay. You don't then also check to the homologous protein from the protein. I just know what my son's workup entailed, and when they found that positive, they just stopped. They stopped. That's what, I guess that's kind of what I was wondering if I should try to send him to get, like, skin prep testing or all that TV. It's called Class Mills at Charles Bill. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. We can get you his number and okay. see what he thinks. Oh, that'd be great. He's a peculiar Englishman, but he's yeah. very smart. Peculiar. <laughs> <laughs> I think we, well, I don't know about everybody else, but I often get patients sent for refractory itching. I want to know what you use for these people, because I mean, I've drugged myself crazy trying all different kinds of medication. And do you have any magic formula to stop itch? No, I don't have the magic formula. I don't have the magic formula, but um, uh, things that things that we will employ. Um, uh, very frequently would be uh, one thing would be narrowband ultraviolet, so narrowband UVB with no rash, just narrowband UVB for itch. Yeah, so especially especially itching that's associated with renal disease or hepatitis C virus um, uh, would be something that certainly consider. Um, if you think it's just you know, uh, you see some people who just itch and don't hide, and mm-hmm. I've used cyclosporin in them. Well, I started doing that after seeing you. You have to make sure they don't have something else. But uh, how long did how long will you use cyclosporin for? Until you get their itch to go away, and, and then taper, taper off the cyclosporin. And that's so be, three to six months, maybe. And that and that that uh, last last. They just have idiopathic pruritus, yeah. which I think is yeah. you know sort of a form first of urticaria. Okay. Other things Thank that that um, that. Um, uh, we will sometimes use our, our kind of atypical things, and uh, for renal disease or hepatitis C related, cholestyramine. I uh, sometimes use that. Um, uh, uh, sometimes using things like uh, um, gabapentin or amitriptyline, um, uh, ondansetron, um, hmm. eroxetine. That's the time to refer to you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so uh, I mean, so when I when I see somebody with 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 itch, and I think um, and I, I try to find any kind of a skin, any sort of skin finding at all, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna aggressively treat that skin finding. So even if they have a little bit of dry skin, I really aggressively treat dry skin. So I have them. I don't have them use very much soap in the shower. Decrease the temperature of their showers. Decrease the duration of their showers. When they get out, only only dab dry and then put a moisturizer on. And so really aggressively treat any sort of skin finding, um, and then and then and they kind of move from there. I think uh, uh, most patients, uh, I'd say probably two thirds to three quarters of patients that that have that have itch have multiple reasons for their itch. It's not just it's not just their skin, or it's not just their nerves, or it's not just their their head or you know, their brain. Most of them have. Have a combination of reasons, so you end up having to kind of do a few, a few different things. That cyclosporin thing is interesting, but especially if they're dermatographic, it helps a great deal. They not only itch, but you can actually show that you can make them hive, and of course you rule out all the other things that make people. Do. Well, thank you. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We can't send you community or... patients, right? You have to be VA sure. patients. You <laughs> have to be VA patients. But the, the, the folks at the, I mean, the, the dermatologists at the U are, are 